recording. Okay, we are recording. What's up, everybody? Drew here, thatanxietyguy.com. It's been a while. Back with Holly. What's up, Holly? Yeah, good. All good. Yes. Happy New Year, everybody. It's uh, January 2018. I know. It's weird, isn't it? It is. Nice kept, I was season? writing the date the other day, and I was just like, oh, I get to say 2017. And I was like really chuffed because I was thinking it was 2017 because that still felt like the new year. And then I was yeah. like, oh, my God, it's 2018. Yeah, That's 2018. Crazy. I know. Did you have uh, – how were your holidays? Were they good? Yeah, pretty good. Yeah. yeah it was quiet. I'm in Mallorca, so it's, it doesn't really feel like Christmas because it's kind of quite sunny. and. I don't know how you deal with that. I couldn't. Like, that's not Christmas, you know? No, I know. Yeah. Our friends in Australia, that's what they deal with. I know. Well, my husband and his family, they're South African, so they're just like, oh, this is winter, you know? But yeah, yeah, yeah. Christmas is hot for them, right? Yeah. So anyway, we are, it's been a while because um, we, everybody's just yeah, been kind of busy so and we are back with the uh, next chapter of hope and help for your nerves by Dr. Weeks, Dr. Claire Weeks. If you have not, there you go. Thank you, Holly. Uh, if you do not have the book, maybe go get it. It's really cheap on Amazon to follow along with us. We're going to do chapter eight today. If you haven't seen the first seven chapters, uh, you can go to my website, thatanxietyguy.com and I, I can't, I'll try and remember the link, but I actually have a link there that shows you the whole thing or my YouTube channel. There's a playlist there. So um, yeah. yeah, catch up on the first seven. I channels. subscribe to that anxiety guy and it pops up on my phone when you put a new video up, which oh, it doesn't really, really, yeah, it's going like, boop, boop, Drew's got a new video. I think probably because YouTube has changed it. So if you do subscribe, I think you have to hit the little bell icon now to get notified. Oh, right. I'm a bad YouTuber because I never like beg for subscribers and stuff. I should. I know I should. It's just handy to know when the next one's out. I know, right? So anyway, let's talk about chapter eight. Chapter eight is uh, entitled Fear of Leaving the Safety of Home, parentheses, agoraphobia. And this is a, this is a subject that I have extensive experience with because I have dealt with this in the past. Uh, yeah, me too. Yeah, yeah. So let's talk about what good old Dr. Weeks says about what agoraphobia is. And I, I found it interesting that she kind of discussed, although again, keep in mind as you're listening to us that this book was written, I think in the sixties. So it's the early sixties as yeah, well. I think. Yeah. So it's, some of the concepts are a little bit dated, but she talks about, you know, the classical um, definition of agoraphobia, which is fear of an, an open space, you know, or fear of the marketplace. Fear of the marketplace right. Agora. Yeah, exactly. Um, it's a Greek word, but so she gets into that, but it's interesting. She talks about how most people with agoraphobia try to conceal it. Which is yeah, it's interesting, that isn't it? I I'm saw not sure that. if that still applies today. I think it does, but less so certainly than when it was written. But yeah, yeah, I, I think I had to think about that for a second when I was reading it because I'm not sure. Did I ever try? I, I probably did conceal it. I don't know if I was making a concerted effort to conceal it, but I probably wasn't when I was dealing with that. I I didn't just I didn't run around telling everybody that I knew about it either. Yeah, I yeah, yeah I concealed panic disorder just full everything about <laughs> it. Just completely concealed it. So yeah, I had just a billion excuses of, of all yeah. that. And she talks about that, that, you know, people conceal it and they, they just make excuse after excuse to avoid, you know, seeing friends or going to family functions. And it's all about not wanting to leave. And I think we'll modify our definition of agoraphobia a little bit. Um, not wanting to leave the safety of, of the home is what she's talking about. But yeah. it's, it's really all about going into situations and places that are going to make you feel uncomfortable. That's really what agoraphobia is. And uh, she also mentions, which is interesting, um, about how more women seem to suffer from agoraphobia. But th I think that's an older concept also. Yeah. That's reporting bias to a certain extent. Um, and I think it's from the days, the 50s. Yeah, and like maybe men didn't want to admit to it. Or it, Exactly. Or I think women were more like, were less likely to be out in the workforce, so they did just naturally spend more time at home. And yeah. I think all of those cultural things, at least in the West, you know. Sort and of, here's my theory. Uh, we were just discussing off, off air. Yes. Um, I had like, when I was reading my research for this chapter, I was like, oh my God, busy people don't get agoraphobia. I mean, of course they, they do, but if you're staying busy, it doesn't, it, it's physically sort of can't happen to you because you're, if you're leaving the house, then you're not being agoraphobic. Do you know that's, what I mean? That's true. That's it's when true. you stop or when you're in the house, um, then it sort of sets in. That's what I find. So maybe like with the women who were traditionally more at home, it's hard when you're at home all day to well, then... Get I think out. that's true because I think you wind up in a situation where 
if you're out of the house all the time, and, and let's talk about, you know what, we, we could talk about how agoraphobia develops. And I know one of the things that's a little bit of a pet peeve for me is when people talk about agoraphobia as a disease. And I've heard that. Like, this is, I have a disease, it's agoraphobia. It's not, a, you know, I'm sorry, it's not a disease. It, it's a learned state. Nobody chooses to learn this, of course. I'm not, I'm not saying we choose to be this way, but it is a learned state. It's a cognitive malfunction. It's not a disease. And especially yeah. when I hear people say, well, I started taking XYZ medication and it cured that disease, it cured agoraphobia. Nah, it didn't. It just took away your anxiety symptoms, which meant that you could go out of the house. So exactly. agoraphobia is really what happens because she says um, she avoids and avoids and avoids is, is one of the headings, subheadings. And it, it, that kind of leads us to how, to how do you wind up being agoraphobic? It usually will always stem from some anxiety state, right? Yeah. So you have an anxiety disorder, you have panic disorder, you're having panic attacks. Agoraphobia is what happens when you begin to avoid every place that you experience panic or anxiety. So first the supermarket and you stop going there. Then the school and you stop going there. Then the shopping mall, you stop going there. Then work and you stop going there. Then school and you stop going there. And your world gets smaller and smaller and smaller until the only place that you feel that you might be safe is in your home. Or even I've known people who have been confined to one place in their home, the sofa, the bedroom, you know, for very long stretches of time. So that's what agoraphobia really is. It's, it's the natural progression of avoidance. I, I can't go here. I can't go here. I can't go here. I can't go here. Things get smaller and smaller and smaller. And suddenly the only place that you really have is your home. Yeah. Um, you know, the only other thing I'll sure. add to that is that, which she doesn't particularly mention, is that f I know for me when I was young, because I was 11 when it sort of fully came on, on to me. Right. Um, was that it wasn't that I was necessarily because I was just in a panic attack state, like you know, up and down kind yeah. of constantly, you know. And it's so I, it, to me, I wasn't really bothered that oh no, if I go here, I'll have a panic attack. It was because I was just having it all the time anyway. But I was just deathly afraid of people seeing me have a panic attack because that would just make it a million times worse in my head. Because I guess it was some sort of like social anxiety on top of it, you know, like. Yeah. Okay. Time I see. I think I suffered every type of anxiety altogether in a very sort of intensive burst, and so and I had to learn to to not care what people thought about me in order to be able to get back to school and stuff. In the end, that's sort of like I just sort of gave up caring, you know, like yeah, yeah, um, which is just very slightly different to the if you're just scared of where it's going to happen to you, you know. Um, Interesting. Okay. So for you, it was, you actually had two different, it wasn't so much that you would panic is that you didn't, it was that you would panic and you didn't want people to see you panic. Yeah. So At the that, beginning it was, I mean, as I got older and stuff and I got better, but I then, it, then it was a bit of everything really, to be honest. but that's just one facet of it that I think that um, just isn't covered in here. And so that can make it 10 times harder. I think if you're then afraid that people are going to see you and what are they going to think? And then that makes you even more in an anxious I, state. Do you see what I mean? could totally believe that then, I guess if you, you don't want, yeah, sure. You don't want people to, yeah, makes yeah, sense. I don't know why I was so bothered, but at the time I was so bothered. It was just like, that would be the worst case scenario. It was people, my school friends seeing me have like these panic attacks because when you're a teenager, that kind of stuff is, it's, it's embarrassing. I get it. <laughs> sure. I get it. It's a sucky time. <laughs> well, interestingly, let, let's go through. And so that's kind of how it, how it develops is you begin to avoid more and more places, either because you're afraid of how you're going to feel. And I think, and we've said this in other chapters too, and in all my other podcasts and stuff, it's not so much that you are afraid of that particular place. And, yeah. and she mentions this, you, you know, that the supermarket won't collapse on you and you know, the manager, what is she something about the manager of the supermarket isn't going to shoot you with a gun. You know that. Yeah. So you're not, you don't become afraid of those places. You become afraid of how you will feel in those places. Exactly. She specifically mentions that. So, and, and actually there's a, a really good book uh, called the agoraphobia handbook that I've, I've mentioned to a few people over time. And in the beginning of that book too, they also, and it's a good book because it takes you through some, you know, worksheets and exercises you could do to start to deal with this. But they even define it as agoraphobia is not the fear of leaving the house. It's the fear of going into places where you will have a symptom attack, which is, yeah. which is, oh, yeah, so which is exactly what it is. You just don't want to go places where you might feel badly or you think you might feel badly. So that's what that's all about. And she, what's interesting is how, and she, she uses she, 
all the time. She, 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 the chapter. Like it's very, it's a little bit, a little bit sexist in a way, but just stick with it. Remember the time that nah, men get all the he, he, he all the time. So yeah. So we'll give you this one. I mean, we're going to oh, give thanks. you a chapter on agoraphobia. <laughs> <laughs> that's not cool. That's all right. We'll give you the agoraphobia chapter. Um, <laughs> it's so strange. And, and, and at one point she, she also even talks about the label and you had mentioned this. She doesn't want to use the term yeah. agoraphobia. Yeah, she says at the end, she says, because she sort of has an introductory paragraph where she talks about how it sort of develops and what it is. And then she right. says, I will not use the term agoraphobia again. It labels fear too definitely and makes it sound too discouragingly permanent. And I totally agree. I'm not saying we shouldn't call it agoraphobia, but I totally agree with the sort of sentiment of that. And I, I've seen people say stuff like, oh, I don't, go, I don't leave the house because I'm agoraphobic. So therefore I... Do right. this, like have all these sort of round cuts to, to stuff and it's like I know what you're saying but it's just it's almost in the language that it's been said in it makes it feel like oh you know I have diabetes so I don't eat these types of food or do you know what I mean like yes. it's not that permanent you know it that's isn't the thing like I said before I have agoraphobia therefore I can't drive right. in my car right exactly I have like you said I have diabetes so I can't eat cake you know, it, it's not that. And that's why I said before, it's not a disease. I don't like when people label it that I have this disease or this, I am agoraphobic. I am, you know, they, those are tough things. It's just like anything else. These are just bad cognitive habits that we can. Yeah. Unlearn. Like currently I am leaning to, I am, I have agoraphobic <laughs> tendencies. Or right. Or, you know, that is so funny because I have used that exact phrase many times yeah. over the years. Like, if I'm not careful, I will start to exhibit agoraphobic tendencies. I have literally said that many times. So that's so funny. Me too, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So I like that. She doesn't want to give it any more, you know, any more power than it deserves, I guess. So then she goes on to, you know, talk about, uh, she again, so sexist. I, I love the cultural references, though. You know, in quotes, the subheading. It all started after the birth of my baby. And it's so funny because it, it kind of does speak to the time when, you know, panic disorder, anxiety disorders, agoraphobia, sometimes we're even referred to as housewives disease. I mean, yeah. Well, I think Valium was always known as mother's little helper. Mother's little helper. I know. Like, Hey, if you're listening, by the way, don't boycott me. I'm not, a, I'm a good dude. I swear. I'm just, just telling you what, <laughs> what she, what she wrote. <laughs> but I think there's quite a lot, but I can understand, like I've heard a lot of people say like how after the birth of their baby, you know, this sort of like has happened to them because a, I think hormonally it can be a difficult time sometimes, which can be anxiety, like panic attack sort of producing and stuff and anxiety producing. And then sure. also because especially if you used to go out a lot or do stuff like when you have a baby that you're looking after, whether you're the man or the woman that's looking after the, the baby, you're in the house a lot, you know, and it's, and it's sort of like, so whether you were even meaning to avoid stuff, you are like not doing as much outside of the house than you used to. And so right. I can totally understand how it sets in. I still, I struggle with it sometimes now because I've got a, a one-year-old, you know, mm -hmm. and, and you do find yourself at home a lot and it's sometimes difficult to go out and, and, and do more stuff. And so it, it absolutely is that sort of breeding ground for agoraphobia. I can see um, that. Yeah. And then obviously if you're like suffering anxiety and you're not sort of aware of how to deal with the anxiety, which mm -hmm. we discussed in the previous chapters, you know, and then, so like, for me, it's like quite a simple equation, like anxiety and avoidance equals agoraphobia. That's, a, that's very true. That is the perfect formula right there. Yeah. Um, and I think you're right. So if you are a new mom and you're, you, you know, just the practical nature of being a mom, is going to keep you in the house a little bit more. That's yeah. even worse. Or maybe if you lost your job, you got made redundant or yeah. whatever. Sure. And then suddenly like you're in the house and you're like, I don't know what to do or, you know, and you're just yeah. not out and about as if you're not like being kept busy by being out and about. Cause and you don't have a reason to go or, or you can't go because you're dealing with an infant for whatever. Or if you've been ill, you know, like a long-term sure. illness, did your sure. back in or something, these things like, yeah, they all have a knock on that. It, it's that, breeding ground you know? so so we have that combination of anxiety plus avoidance and avoidance can come in two flavors it's it's chosen avoidance and then there's also that sort of unchosen or forced avoidance because of illness or life circumstances or whatever you just it's something we should just remain aware of because i know we were talking again before we went on the air that you know both of us if we're not careful those sort of things could sneak in again 
So, you know, a snowstorm here in New York anyway, like the Christmas break, I'll I'll tell you just briefly, and we're getting at a tangent a little bit, but I I think it it applies. There were past uh, times in the past when, you know, we'd have the Christmas break here. So especially the kids would would end just before Christmas Eve. They wouldn't go back to school until after New Year's. And there were times when that break, uh, we had two years, I believe, where the break was a full two weeks long. And then we have cold weather. We might have snow. It's the perfect recipe for everything just slows down. You know, people aren't really looking for you at work. And it is a recipe for like hibernating for a week or two, you know, and just like retreating from the world, which is nice if you want a break or whatever. But I have experienced the highest anxiety day of the year for me was traditionally New Year's Day because that's it. This break is over and now I must get back to the business of not being agoraphobic. Um, Yeah. It's interesting. I, I thought about well, it this year. New Year's Day be the last day of your sort of holiday. Yeah, and it, it, if New Year's Day fell on a Saturday or Sunday, there'd be still another day or so two. So it's the anticipation as well exactly. of knowing. But it, but it was the marking of this is it. Like that season between Thanksgiving and New Year where you, where you got a little bit of a break, and especially between Christmas and New Year, where yeah. the world gave everybody a break for the most part. Like, oh, I'm away for the week. No one would question that. I'm just not around for the week. Yeah, um, yeah. It, that day was always a very, very difficult day for me to deal with. It's not anymore. In fact, I thought about it this New Year's Day thinking like, I don't even, I don't even give a second thought anymore. But it was traditionally a very difficult day for me anxiety-wise because it would mean like, okay, agoraphobic tendencies are not okay anymore starting tomorrow. So I got to yeah. go back to fighting the fight. It was really difficult. So just be wary of avoidance, especially, you know, forced or unforced. So she talks about, you know, if, if like this, you are, you are not really afraid of wide open spaces or of the marketplace, you know perfectly well that if you go to the corner store, the grocer won't shoot you, blah, blah, blah. So what are you afraid of? She says, you are afraid of the feelings that arise within you when you're in this situation. Feelings that seem to overwhelm you so that you seem unable to think clearly while they are present. You don't trust yourself while you're like this. And this is why you're afraid to go out by yourself. And I think that pretty much nails it. That's exactly what makes agoraphobia. You are afraid to go out because of how you might feel. Yeah. Yeah. And then she goes on to, this is a good chapter because she, she tries to do a bit of a, a guided, if it was an audio book, she would be doing almost a guided exposure. But yeah. She's written in a written form here. And she talks about imagining how she herself is taking you out of the house on an excursion of some kind. And imagine what she would tell you to, to get you through it. And it's pretty good. But the point she makes is she starts with, well, here's your very first mistake. And I think if you're, if you're dealing with agoraphobia right now, you could totally relate to this. Before you've opened the front door, you've tensed yourself like a violin string. So that's that anticipatory thing where before mm-hmm. you even decide to go out the door, you're, you're all ratcheted up and, and ready to panic. And the anticipation just sort of is the destroyer of most things. It, it is. Right. It is. It's the destroyer of exposure to begin with. So it stops yeah. people from even getting off the dime. And it, it just sets you up immediately for like, it, I'm not going to say it sets you up for failure, but it sets you up. You don't want to leave because you're afraid of how you might feel. Well, when you start this way, it's almost guaranteed that you're going to feel shitty when you get out the door. Yeah. Yeah. And she but talks about that. If you're scared that you're going to feel anxious or, and panicky, panic sure. attacky, then by being anxious about being anxious, you know, it's just well, like you're afraid to be feeling. afraid. Yeah, you're right. self-fulfilled prophecy, you know. Right, like if I go out the door, I'm going to be terrified. So I am terrified to be terrified. And it makes sense. But I, and I think this is not something that you can necessarily stop. This is what you, exposure is going to help you with this as well. But acknowledging that, because so many people will say to me, like, I, how am I supposed, I can't even get out the door. I'm afraid to get out the door. How do I do this? Well, yeah. it's supposed to be that way. You're going to feel that way. And Dr. Weeks well, told me your first mistake. One of my biggest tips on on that is just to <laughs> do stuff straight away, like in yeah. the morning, yeah. or, or set a time, and you go regardless of what how you're feeling or whatever. And if you, uh, I, I've read quite a lot into anticipation anxiety, and if you give yourself an out where you can go, like, oh, maybe I'll go, maybe I won't, depends how I feel at the time, which used yeah. to be my slogan. <laughs> um, that actually just makes it so much worse like you think that you're like well i'm giving myself an out so therefore i won't be as anxious they right. say that like all the studies and everything show that it actually does the opposite and if you just commit and you know that you go in right 
regardless it actually kind of makes it easier and i promise it it really does like, it does it really does i've done it that with flights and all sorts like when i was really bad i was like oh you know we had to fly to south africa it's like an 11 12 hour flight and i was just like oh what if i can't go at the end will you still to my husband like will you still go like i don't want your sort of trip to be ruined yeah, just yeah. Like, no you have right. to come Right. Coming, whether you like it. And I was like, but what if I'm panicking on the plane? He's just like, I don't care. Oh, well. Yeah. <laughs> Good for him. I don't care. And I was actually like, oh, okay. And then as soon as I was just like, okay, so I'm going to South Africa regardless. And I was just like, yeah, okay. All right. Well, okay. I'm going. Whatever. All right. There you go. All right. You have no out that way. It weirdly just made everything a lot easier. And I think it's that, that sitting on the fence between I will, I won't, I will, I won't. There's enough fear as it is already. And yeah. that, that I will, I won't, I will, I won't. It just seems to exacerbate it. It makes it worse. So yeah. I, I know for me, and I guess everybody's routine is a little bit different. What really helped me was just, I would literally roll out of bed and immediately go out the door. Like immediately. I, I mean, you know, just put on a hat and whatever, like throw on whatever clothing I saw first. It didn't matter. I wasn't going out to win a fashion contest. I was just, I was just practicing getting out yeah. and getting in that habit, which was hard the first few days, but then it became a habit and there was no thinking about it. It wasn't getting up, eating breakfast, sitting at the kitchen table, thinking about, and oh, I'm going to go out soon. I'm going to go out soon. I just did it immediately. That was a huge Yeah, and, and watch what you said. I wasn't thinking about it, which no. is kind of floating, isn't it? Like the Dr. Weeks floating kind of thing. It's sure, a little bit. Like, I'm not going to think about it. Just do it. But you make that commitment that says, I'm going to go out the door. I'm probably going to feel awful when I do this. I'm going to be terrified, but I, I, I'm just committed to that. This is what I'm going to do. Tomorrow morning, I'm going to be shared, scared shitless. Like, okay. And that's just what I'm going to do. So I just didn't give my, myself any time to think about what was going to happen. Yeah. I would get out of bed and bam, go right out the door, which yeah. sucked in the winter when it was freezing and snowing. But it was a huge, I agree with you. You should not give yourself an out, like do it as quickly as you can, as yeah. early in your day as you possibly can. So you're not thinking about like it. Talk to anybody, whether they suffer from anxiety or not, when they've got a flight that they have to catch and it's in the evening, it is just the worst because you spend all day right. like, uh, like right. flight coming. even if you're not scared of flying or scared of anything like that, it's just sort of like this thing that hangs over. And by the end of the day, like you really wound up, you know? Um, and for really no reason in the end. No. You know, I was at Mark Twain. I just saw that in the forum. Somebody said the other day, it was a really good quote. Most of the worst things that the worst things in my life never happened. happened. Yeah, that was a great, great quote. I don't know who said that. Whoever, if you were listening, thank you. That was a good, really good quote. But not giving your time to yourself time to think about that was is, is really a key thing, a real key yeah. thing. So I'm, I'm a big fan of that for sure. Um, but again, it takes that commitment. You have to be willing to do this first. Yeah. So uh, one, I highlighted one more, par one more thing in that paragraph. She says, if one, so she says you've tensed, before you even leave, you've tensed yourself up like a violin string, right? You're all tensed up. And she says, if one plucks a taut violin string, it will vibrate and make a noise. But if you loosen the tuning peg and the string is slack, it doesn't make any noise. It doesn't, it just lays there. So yeah. she's, that's a really good analogy. Because it's really you, good, isn't it? Right? If you can learn... If you could, so almost the first exposure that you have to do when you're agoraphobic is the exposure and anticipatory anxiety. Even if your outings are very small or even almost non-existent, open the door and stand on the front step is all you can manage. That's fine. But you will learn to relax in the face of the anticipation first. So you almost have to expose yourself to the anticipatory anxiety and learn to you know, go slack and relax into that first before you can learn to be, relax in the supermarket or whatever your goal is. So it's, it's a really good analogy. I think it's just, it's a really good point. So then she, you know, she talks about not making the first mistake. You got to slacken those strings. You have to learn to relax. So work on the anticipatory anxiety first, just let it be there, feel it. Don't tense against it and learn to relax into it. Like we've been talking about. Yeah. And so what does she say? The worst that can happen to you out there in the street or in the shop is that you can let yourself become frightened. That's the worst thing that can happen is that you can allow yourself to be frightened. But I think we have to clarify that and say, she's not saying that the worst thing that can happen is that you are afraid. The worst thing that can happen is that you react to being afraid. You allow yourself to be afraid of being afraid. I think yeah. that's what she really is talking about here because you're going to be afraid. That's okay. It's expected in the beginning. So, you know, she says, I know how severe that fright can be, but if you release as much tension as possible and be prepared to accept that, you know, then it won't be quite so overwhelming. So if I already know when I get in the car, I'm, I'm going to be freaking out, 
then I won't be surprised that I'm freaking out and it won't be, I'm, I'm expecting it. I'm prepared for it. I know it's going to happen. It's not a mystery. Just bring it. And, and it's not as bad suddenly. Yeah. You know, and, and we've talked about this many times, like the key, the success, and this is where you're dealing with panic attacks or agoraphobia. The success is not measured by not feeling anxiety or fear. It's measured by how you deal with that. And this is a good yeah. example that she's saying right here. So I, mean, she, I just, I, I realized that this, we, that Christmas break that you're talking about, exactly this happened to me this year. So like, cause you know, I, I go and I'm working, I'm doing this, I'm doing stuff. And then suddenly like over the Christmas week, cause it, wow. I had gigs, you know, all over, but like yeah. there was about a week where I wasn't doing anything. It was just okay. home and stuff. And then I was like, Oh, I, I needed to go into, into Palmer, into the city to go yeah. and buy a hat for a video shoot. It sounds ridiculous. <laughs> and I was up against the clock. Um, cause, and, and so suddenly I was just like, so it was quite not a stressful thing. It's quite a drive. I had to take the baby with me. And suddenly I kind of was like, oh my God, I'm feeling like anxious about this. What's this about? And it was kind of like a weird sort of like, I'm feeling like really anticipated patient and and just sort of like but I was just like well I've just got to go and do it so I'll just like luckily I had to go and do it because yeah. we had to shoot like that evening sort of thing okay and, um, whereas if I think I didn't have to I would just be like oh I'll go tomorrow and get a hat <laughs> so I had to get in the car and I went and I'm shopping and it's in the mall and it's all like you know busy and Christmas tunes and you know like it was just oh, yeah. sort of kind of horrible mauly sort of stuff and I was expecting, I was expecting that I would feel okay later on. And I still was feeling like a bit, cause I was still up against it. Like I was just spending more and more time, like not getting the stuff done that I needed to. And so mm. I was just like stressed really, but it was coming out as sort of anxiety. And, um, and I just think, uh, I just hadn't, I just it caught me by surprise, you know what I mean? And I was just like, this is so strange. I don't get anxious anymore. Um, I don't really know what the moral of the story is. I just carried on and got the hat and then I went home and I was, and then when I got home, I sort of forgot about it and then everything was fine. And then the next time I went to the shop, it was fine again. It, was but nothing. it just sort of reminded me that like a while ago, an episode like that, I guess would have been, I would have read so much into it. Like, mm -hmm. Oh my God, does this mean I'm back at square one? Does this mean I suffer from anxiety again? And two, I probably wouldn't have gone or I would have found an excuse to not go. Like, I don't really need a hat for the video shoot. Or, do you know what I mean? Like all sorts of things. And, um, and I think also what is just key to remember is that even when you, even people that don't suffer anxiety and stuff, like have stressful days where they don't feel great and to do stuff on top of feeling terrible is just part of like, live in and i used to make this mistake of thinking everyone else who didn't suffer from panic disorder just felt amazing all the time yeah and then yeah just, look at them in the town shopping in the <laughs> rain they're fine aren't they and just like they're miserable and just having a horrible day and they've got money stress and this stress and all sorts of stuff going on look at them and their smiling faces yeah and it's weird isn't it you just Curse assume you. everyone else is fine and they're not and i just think so much of I know like it's a different thing but like the exposures and stuff like that going out and feeling horrible when you're doing stuff like that I just, it's just so important to not it doesn't mean anything it just means you're ha like you're feeling awful and you and you go and do something and then right. and then later you don't feel awful do you know what I mean I don't I'm not really explaining no I, I well I think you know First of all, you had the Christmas week and you said you were just sort of home a lot. And so, yeah, but people like us, even, you know, and look, I'm, I'm everywhere now. It doesn't matter to me, but if I'm not careful, those tendencies will crawl back in. So I think it's just an illustration of how ingrained those patterns can be. Yeah. Right. They really, ingrained. they really are ingrained. And I think in the end, you know, we come for the factory, you know, program to seek comfort and safety. So Anything that isn't that becomes really easy to avoid. So if we always have those triggers laying under us, you know, to, to understand like, and, and I think sometimes they're just, these are just patterns. They're pathways that get wired in, you know, at some point and we can wire over them, but I don't know if we necessarily always, you know, always wipe out the old wiring. So, you know, when you talk about 
brain plasticity and, and the way we learn and neural pathways. And yeah. all that stuff. You know, maybe some of those pathways are still there. So when you get into a familiar situation, which is not a good situation, but it's familiar, just being home all the time you know, suddenly those pathways are lit a little bit more than the, the yeah. newer ones, the go, go, go pathways, you know, so, you know, really common. And you're right. We, we, we ascribe so much like significance to every minute of how we feel and how our exposure was and what happened and how did I, what did I say and how did I stand and how was I breathing and what did that person do and what did my husband or my wife do? And, and in the end, it's just another day. Like yeah. it's, it's just another day. And, you know, we were talking before about just get out, like don't, don't allow yourself an out. Don't think about it all day. Do it as soon as you can. I used to try and think too, like, like your hat situation. Look, I can, right now it's, it's 11 a.m. on a Saturday morning. It's going to be noon. You know, in 60 minutes, no matter what I do, noon is going to happen. Yeah. I can't stop noon from coming. It's going to come at 60 minutes from now, no matter what I do. So, yeah. so I used to think about like, I can go out the door and make some progress in the next 60 minutes and that and noon is going to come and I'll be done. You know, I won't, I'll have, I'll have accomplished it. I can rest. I can retreat. I would give myself all these like little pep talk or I could just sit here like a lump and noon is going to happen anyway. So how do I want to feel when noon hits? Do I want to feel like a failure or do I want to feel like, all right, well, it's noon just like it was going to be anyway. And I did something yeah, good. Yeah. Minutes. So there's so many different ways to approach That's so good and motivational, not just for anxiety, but just in general. Or just anything. Like, no matter what happens, it's going to be 7 p.m. tonight. No matter what happens, I can't stop that from coming. So what am I going to do in the time between now and then? Like, how yeah. am I going to feel when I get there? So if I have something crappy to do, like shopping for a hat that I don't want to buy, well, you know, I can get to 7 p.m. discover, well, I got my hat. I accomplished it. I'm good. I checked it off my list. Or I can get to 7 p.m. and be pissed off because I didn't go hat shopping. So which yeah. one do I want to be? Yeah. Done like, this hat. <laughs> this hat is the bane of my existence. <laughs> it wasn't even my music video when I hate your hat. <laughs> so, <laughs> so anyway, let's go back to Dr. Weeks. She, Sorry, she yeah, takes you. It's all right. No, it's okay. This is why we do this. So she takes you by the hand and she walks you out the door, right? So she talks about slackening the violin strings. Don't go out already tensed up and ready to panic. And we're walking down the street and here comes Mrs. X. I guess Mrs. X appears to be her version of like the gossipy neighbor. Yeah, and also, but here comes Mrs. X, yeah, so it's like, oh, and you're scared that Mrs. X is going to notice that you're all anxious and stuff, and that's a bit like my sort of social, like, mm -hmm. oh, people are going to see me panicking, and she's just like, people don't really think about stuff like that, she just thinks, she's just excited to see you, Mrs. Right. X, she hasn't seen you in ages, because you've been in your house all the time, that's what Dr. Weeks says, she yes. says, Mrs. X comes running over to you and you're like, oh my gosh, she's coming over because she's going to be like, where have you been or what are you doing? Or, sure. And she's just like, oh great, I haven't seen you in ages. Are you good? Oh, it's so good to see you. Yeah. And I think Mrs. X serves two purposes in this little passage here. She illustrates that. Number one, that fear of like being judged or how, oh, what is X, Mrs. X going to think about me now that she sees me? She doesn't really think about you. She, thank you, Anne Rand. <laughs> but I don't think about you. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and I think, Sometimes what happens with, for people like us when we're in these anxiety states, we're dealing with things like agoraphobia, we get so wrapped up in ourselves that we think everybody's thinking about us. Guess what? Yeah. No one's thinking about you. I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but when I was stuck in my house, like none of my neighbors or friends or coworkers or employees gave a rat's ass that I was stuck in no. my house. They weren't thinking about me. They just weren't. So there's that. And number two, she uses Mrs. X as an example of, of a trap. So now you're out and you're in the street with Dr. Weeks holding your hands and here comes Mrs. X. Number one, what is she going to think of me? And number two, what if she wants to talk to me now oh, yeah, yeah. and I can't escape? I'm trapped. I'm trapped in the conversation with Mrs. X. So she, she gives a good example of like, okay, so now she's excited to see you and Mrs. X starts blabbing at you with the neighborhood gossip or whatever she wants to talk about and your heart starts racing. And, she, and Dr. Weeks says, uh, you know, so what? Essentially, so what? And we talk about this all the time. Does it matter if you feel your heart beating? It doesn't matter in the least, right? It certainly doesn't matter to your heart. Like your heart doesn't care. So she tries yeah. to the example of like, let Mrs. X talk, chatter, gag, go for it. And she says yeah. like- Your heart's like, I've been beating the whole time you hadn't noticed as well. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like, hello, I'm just here doing what I do. Like go I've been doing away. this for you know, 51 years or however old you are. It's, it, it, your, our heart doesn't care. It makes no judgment. And so she talks about imagining her, Dr. Weeks. And if you've ever listened to her audiobooks, you would hear her voice. She sounds like somebody's grandma to me. She, she was older, I think, when she recorded. 
and she has that, that adorable accent that everybody here in the U.S. loves. And um, she British or Australian? She's Australian, I right? Think she's Australian, but she didn't seem. Oh, to, I, don't know, but I think she British, sounds quite English. Right, she? right, she does. Yeah, but um, yeah, she has a very like comforting like grandma's kind of voice. But and so she's she pretends she whispers to you like let let get relax, take a breath, chill out, kind of thing. And you know, basically, she talks about if you do that suddenly. The minute you relax, suddenly you don't feel as trapped as Mrs. X talks about, like the mailman or whatever she wants to talk about. So it's it's a good illustration of like, you know, she what she's trying to tell you is, see, like Mrs. X isn't a trap. There is no trap. It was you upsetting yourself. Yeah. And when Mrs. You let X go, didn't upset you. You upset right, you, you did. Right, exactly. So you you interpreted that situation as dangerous when it was not. And if you let that go, suddenly you're still might, might, might be interested in the conversation, but suddenly you don't feel like you're, you know, at gunpoint anymore. So yeah. it's, a, it's a really good illustration. It's, and that's the like, process. Yeah. Yeah. Just of, relax into it and everything gets better. Yeah. Yeah. Every, <laughs> magically, everything does start to get better. <laughs> and it's so interesting, you know, um, I've seen a bunch of those posts in our little discussion group on Facebook and I'll put a link. So if you're not in the group request to join and, and come on in, it's a great group of people. And I've seen people make those posts over the past few weeks that like, Oh, I was out and I started to panic and I thought about it for a second and I just relaxed and suddenly it got better. You know, in 10 minutes I, I was over it and I was out and, you know, still had my coffee or we finished shopping and, and they're just so excited that they succeeded. And, Yes, she says it right here. And this, this, she's telling you, like, just relax. It'll, it'll get better almost instantly. So what else does she do? She starts taking us down the trip a little more, awesome. crossing the road. Yeah. She talks jelly, about jelly legs. legs. The old jelly jelly legs. legs will still get you there. That's exactly what I highlighted. That's, you can't see. It's all whited out. But jelly <laughs> legs will still get I, I highlighted that exact thing on my stupid little Kindle here. Jelly legs will still get you there if you will let them. It's only a feeling, not a true weakness. And we've talked about this so many times. She, she goes into like the actual mechanism of adrenaline is going to change muscle tone and blah, 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 blah. That's why your legs feel like jelly. But so they feel that way. But it doesn't mean they are actually jelly. Yeah. It's right. not like, don't let that be the excuse to not continue to be like, oh, but, you know, I, right. my legs felt like they were going to collapse. So I physically couldn't go on anymore. Felt like. Key, key felt phrase. Like. It felt like, it felt like, and I've seen that too. I've seen those in many, many discussions. It felt like, yeah, but felt like wasn't is. Like, you did, did you actually collapse? No, it just felt, felt like, like I was going to pass out, yeah. Right, so running home doesn't make your legs any stronger, right? Think no, it's, yeah. I yeah. mean, if you think about it, why would going home cure any of your physical symptoms? You I know? Don't know. You know, it's easy. I think, you know what? It's easy for us sitting here. I know. <laughs> and Tom stay joking with each other to say that, and, and I think... I'd a lot of people watching would probably exactly. do the same thing. Like, if I, can, I would always think if I can just get home, everything will be okay. Everything will be fine. And then when you stop and analyze it, you're just like, why? Because I'll relax because yeah. I'll be like, oh, phew, I'm home. It's just like, why? What does home give you? No, nothing. And, you know, even now, I, I sometimes will think that. I, was, I happened to be out in the past week, and I haven't really been sleeping well. And anyway, perfect, for me, perfect storm for heightened anxiety. And you know, I, I encountered a little bit of an issue while I was out. And I, and I stopped. I had to pull over for a second and thought, you know, I really had to give it, think about this, because I'm like, I, let me, I'm just going to turn around and go home. Like, in all honesty. And it, but I had to really stop and be honest with myself and say, why do I not want to do this task that I'm doing here? You know, I, like 45 minutes of sleep is not a lot of sleep. I'm exhausted. I really had to reason through that and say, I just need to just take a break. I'm so tired. So, but otherwise the natural tendency is like, I will feel better if I go to some safe place. But like, yeah. you know, being home isn't going to make me physically feel any different than I already was. So what's the difference? It doesn't matter where yeah. you are. Yeah. And I think the, that's quite a good thing to do, isn't it? Every time, if, you, if you're out on like an exposure or something and you're like, and you're just feeling that like, I just need to get this because that's the white knuckling. If you're like, yes. I just need to do this and buy my hat and then everything will get be out. okay. Yeah, yeah. Like that is the wrong way to do it. You just need to sort of stop and think like, what is it you're trying to get to the end of that you think will be okay you know like oh right. once and then because once i've got it then i can go home and then it'll be okay like you need to sort of really like so every time you think like okay now i'm gonna go home like just try and stop yourself and be like why do you think that being at home will be yeah better? 
and just try and sort of maybe just because it was probably maybe personal to each person even you know and just try and maybe. reason it out a little bit to yourself what it is that you're going to gain at home and see how you can give that to yourself like where you are you know like a little bit of it yeah th this came up in discussion in the last week too um like the death, this is, that's interesting, I think. So you deal with this applies not just to agoraphobia, but just about all of this stuff. But agoraphobia, you're trying to get out of the house, right? You're trying to, you're trying to deal with that. There is no destination here. Like for me, when you're trying to get past agoraphobia, there is no, even though by definition, like, well, I can't leave my house. So my goal is to get to wherever. Like for me, it was like, wow, you know, to get back into New York City, which is you know, 40 miles away from me. But in the end, there really is no destination when you're overcoming agoraphobia. The destination is, is the panic. Like you need to go there. And then it doesn't actually, once you go there and you learn how to live there, then there is no more destination. You'd be in the middle of the desert. Yeah. It doesn't mean you could be in a plane and the ocean on a cruise, you know, around the world in your bathroom and your home. It doesn't matter where you are. So it's honestly an amazing when you realize that as well, isn't it? When you it realize is. like, I don't mind where I am because I, I, am. I know how to deal with me and that's fine. And then suddenly like, it's not the things it's, you realize it's you, it's not the things around right. you. It had nothing to do with the airport or, yeah, she actually says this. <laughs> it's, it's, it's you. I have to get it's over like myself. Your hands turn in the screw. That's right. And in the end, and, and and again, that doesn't mean that she she or we are, are are blaming ourselves or blaming you if you're watching or listening. Not blaming you for being in the situation, but we have to take responsibility for our contribution to it because we are in control of that process. And she even says, like, if you, if you chill, you know, you, you, cross, you, you let yourself cross the road. Don't worry about the jelly legs. You know, she says, by now, you know, you cross the road. You made it. And by now, you're not quite so impressed by the tricks your body has been playing on you. Mm. So, you know, suddenly you begin, and we've talked about this a lot, where you unmask that fear as being baseless. And it's a very empowering feeling. Like, once you do that, like, oh, wow, I made it. And I was fine. And that wasn't so bad after all. So she does talk about in the next paragraph, the full fear treatment. And, and, and this could be true. It's, you're trying to get out of the house after being housebound for some period of time. This is true too. I, I've experienced this. You get out and within a given exposure even, suddenly you feel like, wow, this is awesome. You're making all kinds of progress. You know, you're, you're 10, 15 minutes into it and you think you're doing great. And then all of a sudden, she says, in a flash, you turn on all the screws at once and you give yourself the full fear treatment. And it is as if you have made no progress at all just when you thought you were beginning to get the right idea. And I think that happens on the macro level from session to session over days and weeks, but it can yeah. also happen at the micro level within any given session. Like what was great three minutes ago, is just flushed right down the tubes. Yeah. You know, when suddenly you ratchet it up again, you start fighting and you're, you're running from it again. And all of a sudden it's like everything just went to crap and that yeah. can happen from minute to minute. And she acknowledges that. So, it's so true. And like, because what can happen, because what used to happen to me, I'd be like, I'd write off whole months. This is a bad month. This is a bad week. And then, and then like, this is a bad day. Like, oh, I'll just write this day off because I've had so many panic attacks today. Mm -hmm. This is a bad day. And now it's like, this is a bad three minutes. This is a bad minute. This is a bad 30 seconds. Sure. Like, yeah. It, it, and that's what actually, when I was out in the mall buying my hat, I remember thinking to myself as I was driving home, I was just like, okay, this has just been a bit of a, a wish, a, a wipe out of two hours. But the rest of the day was great. And we right. shot the video and it was great. And it was, I didn't feel an ounce. Of, I didn't even think about it anymore. Anxiety. Right. It wasn't a whole day affair anymore. No. And yeah. so, and it, maybe it's nice to hear that you can like suffer anxiety and just be okay. Well, that was a bad hour, but the next hour is fine. You know? Yeah. It doesn't matter. Or, or 10 minutes from now even could be fine again. Yeah, so I think the point here when she, she acknowledges that this can happen is you have to almost expect that it might happen. So yeah. even though, wow, I was doing great. And I've seen people say that like, oh, I was in, I keep talking about the supermarket, but as an example, I was in the supermarket for the first time in weeks, you know, is. yeah. And I was doing great. And then suddenly I realized how far in this, how deep in the store I was. I, oh my God, I was in the dairy section. <laughs> and, and suddenly, you know, you realize what's going on, you freak out and, and you bail on it. So I, I heard that happen, but it can happen. It's just expected to happen. And the yeah. same principles apply. 
no matter how tight you make those screws, the same principles apply. Just untighten them. Yeah. And also remember that if you do panic and then you, or, you know, if you do freak mm -hmm. out on the exposure and then you manage to sort of work through it and relax right. into it, that's amazing. That's the, that's the good. That's the win. That's if the victory. If you don't exposure and you don't feel any anxiety, well, like good for you. I'm glad you had a nice time out. But right, you haven't right. learned anything other than maybe that you don't feel anxious as much as you think you do or something. Sometimes I think it's even worse when, because yeah. I've Does seen that happen too. High. It sets the bar high and I've seen people get to, in that situation where it's, you know, it's great. I've been out all every day this week and I've had almost no anxiety. It's great. And then they go out the next week and they have a panic attack and like, oh, that was all crap last week. It was nothing. Yeah. It was, I get really out. nervous when I see people reporting how they've been anxiety free for a few weeks or something. I'm like, uh, oh, no. <laughs> well, I mean, it's, I, I get what you're saying. It's good. I mean, you want people to have to feel good, of course. Yeah, but you worry about then the expectation, you know? Yes. The, yeah. I, I, to me, I find it a lot, a lot more exciting. I'm not going to say exciting. Like nobody's job is to excite me, but I, I find it more, uh, more important when I hear somebody say like, yeah, I, I kind of freaked out in the dairy section of the supermarket, but you know, I just, I relaxed for a minute. I got through it and I kept shopping or even yeah. somebody who says I, I, I ran out, I got in my car, but then I calmed down and I went back in. Like those yeah. are the huge the way you're improvement rewiring things. Something. Yes, yeah. exactly. So that, that's a big deal. So she does talk about let the storm pass. Um, wait, let the storm pass. Let the effects of adrenaline pass. Even at the climax of your fear, surrender and accept. So she talks about all that stuff. At the very moment when your feelings seem to engulf you, that is the moment above all when you must surrender and accept. No more, oh my goodness, no more what ifs. And we've talked about this ad nauseum. We will continue to talk about it. That the proof is in the pudding at that moment, not yeah. being anxiety free, not and when you are at your worst, when you could just let that happen with and just just bring it on, bring the worst you can bring and just fully accept that and just not care if that lasts for 30 seconds or 30 minutes. You know, you have pretty much at that moment, the first time you do that, you literally have won this war. You don't know it yet, but you have now won that war. You may lose some battles along the way, but when you, the first time you actually ever do that, yes. you, you have won the war. Now it's over. It's now, now that you just have to figure out that you won the war. So yeah, yeah, yeah it's, it's really cool. And she says, if you go forward, however, hesitatingly understanding it with an understanding of what's happening, ready to accept all the tricks your fears may play upon you, your reactions will gradually calm. And, and she's right. That's exactly what happens. So, and she ends the paragraph. I know I'm skipping a lot. It's a short chapter, but, and she ends this paragraph, which I think is huge. You will find peace in the middle uh -huh, of Times true. Square because you will take your cure with you wherever you may be. And so yes. that speaks to so many things, coloring books and rubber bands and mints and water and, and your wife or your husband or your mom or your dad, your girlfriend, your boyfriend, your safe person, your medications, all of those things just, they can all go away. Like you are taking the cure with you in your own pocket yeah. everywhere you go. It's, it's life changing. It's, yeah, it's unbelievably it's good. completely <laughs> life changing. That is such a good yeah. sentence. Yeah. When you, I think also if you get yourself better from panic disorder, the rest of life seems like really like you've cheated, like you've got like <laughs> some tools that other people don't know about, and it's oh, yeah. really cool. Oh yeah, yeah. It's I, I, I will t well, you know what? I'll tell you flat out. Like, I lived a very large portion of my life before the wheels fell off for me in the late nineties when things got bad for me anxiety wise the first time. I kind of lived in like an armor plated way, like nothing. I never got nervous. Nothing bothered me. I wasn't, you know, I, I never got nervous about work or anything or, you know, I was a musician back then and I would get nervous about performing nothing. Like I was, I was like ridiculous. That's not normal, you know? <laughs> yeah. And, and when I, when I, when things got really bad for me, you know, I medicated myself for many years. I stopped taking it, got really bad because of the whole withdrawal thing. Then I suffered, you know, I had to learn to deal with it without the medication. All I wanted was that guy back. I wanted that armor plated bulletproof guy back, but you know what? I'm glad he's not there anymore because the lessons I learned dealing with this, like there is nothing you can bring at me. And at the moment in my life, I have got a pile taller than me, like up right up here that I'm just holding up all the time. Nothing, you know, because you just, 
you just get that like uh, that armor plated feeling, but it's an enhanced armor plating now. Yeah, it, it's not this. It's not a, a brain dead armor plating. It's a reactive armor plating. Like I can, I understand stress, I understand fear, but I can absorb it and reflect it and use it and direct it into good places, and it makes you like a freaking superhero. So yeah. I highly, I highly urge everybody to like <laughs> overcome your agoraphobia because you will get to a level that you didn't think you had in your life. I think this sounds ridiculous, like all Tony Robbins like, but you know, but it's true. You, yeah, you, I can see the smile is. on your face. I think yeah. you know what I'm talking about. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's just like an elevated um I don't know, everything seems so easy to sort of you sort of see how everything how everyone's been affected by their own sort of stresses and stuff as well. And it just seems so sort of obvious what, what's going on and do you know what I mean? And Suddenly you become like this wise person too. Have yeah. you ever noticed that? Like, like I'm just some goofball. I, you know, I'm, I'm no different than you or anybody else. But like, I guess the lessons we learn in this, somehow you, you, people think you're so wise. Or like I find myself saying things or reacting to like, wow, I, I can't believe I actually said that. Like, but mm. that's the experience that I've gone through. And just life experience and, you know, uh, having gone through 50 years or whatever. So it's, it's, it's a thing. And I think... The other thing that it does, and I don't know if you would, so you're, you're a performer, you know, I think in, in some ways you, you encounter the same stressors that like athletes do. And, and you hear all this time, if you're a sports fan, you may have seen some of these things. What made Wayne Gretzky like the greatest hockey player to ever, ever play? What made, you know, Joe Montana, the one of the greatest quarterbacks ever to play American football or whatever athlete you like. And invariably, one of those common threads seems to be their vision in the field. Like they saw things happen before everybody else did. And oh, for cool. them, yes, for them, the game goes slower than everybody else. So even on an, in an ice hockey game where everything is happening so fast, most people can't even follow the puck if they're in the stands watching, much less playing. For those elite players, they perceive time slower and they're just calm and they can see things happening very clearly and they can react appropriately and do things that other people can't do because they couldn't see it. I don't know if you have found the same in your performing career. But after going through what you have gone through, do you feel more like I know I do like the game life happens slower sometimes. So okay. what I get all the time is like, wow, this place could be burning down. And you know, until like my temper goes, cause I have a bad temper, but otherwise like I get that all the time. Like no matter what's going on, you're just like this and you just know what to do. Like you just yeah. what I find really cool was just that freedom of like being able to go anywhere in the world at any time do you know what i mean night yeah. day yeah other continents by Who yourself cares? with people it's like suddenly it's like oh my god like there's no situation that i will avoid like avoid because it makes me anxious about do you know what i mean like yeah. um it yeah. kind of makes me really fearless so i found like just an absolute fearlessness sort of but in a way where you I don't know, or where you sort of, I don't know, you just understand yourself so much more and how you're reacting to it and yeah. that you can just kind of do anything you want, really. That's what I've, I found. I, I think <laughs> it's true. And I, I think only because she mentions it here. She even says, I'll, I'll give you one more, you know, um, she talks about take yourself by, your, by the hand. So in this chapter, she wants you to visualize her taking you by the hand and taking you through an exposure. But then she says, but in the end, you have to learn to take yourself by the hand and it will never fail you if you follow it and follow it until you learn to take yourself by the hand until you are your own guide and your own strength. And yeah. in the end, that really is what gets you past agoraphobia. You will learn to, you will cure yourself. Your doctor won't do it. Your psychologist, your psychiatrist, your mom, your dad, your boyfriend, your girlfriend, no one else will do it. You will do it. We won't do it. The book won't do it. A pill won't do it. You will do it. Yeah. Like, and I find that really empowering. If that's hell a yeah. Happy word. Yeah. But yeah. No, it's a great word. And, and, you know, and sometimes I think when I, sometimes I take a kind of a hard line, especially with people who, I mean, you see who I interact with online sometimes in the groups that we are in together. And I do take a little bit of a hard line, like, hey, stop feeling sorry for yourself. Stop just, stop the what if, stop comparing symptoms. Like, I truly believe that everybody came from the factory with that inside them. We all have it. And I would love if everybody experienced the same thing that you're talking about, that I'm talking about. 
that other friends of ours who have overcome this are talking about. Like, yeah. it's a great, great, great thing. Like, your life doesn't have to be stuck in your living room. It doesn't really doesn't it, have to be. I, I don't know if she would mind me saying this, but one of our um, friends, um, right. who was also an admin of a, a panic disorder group, who lost right. her father recently, Yes. Um, she messaged me and said that she, uh, and I was like, how are you doing, you know, after your like the sort of father passed away and she said do you know what i've found that if i accept the symptoms of grief it's it's okay like i'm ex like and it's kind of like the same thing as the anxiety like so she's not saying she's fine she's obviously like very no, upset and grieving but she's right. saying but she's expecting to feel it and she's accepting those feelings and she said and somehow it just makes everything a lot better you know that she yeah so she's actually like I'm doing okay because I'm accepting that I'm feeling horrible. You know? Right. I mean, she's I going know. to feel sad and devastated and empty and all those things. Uh, absolutely. But, but she's, yet, she's not fighting it. Exactly. And I think that that's such an amazing yeah. lesson, you know, very healthy. She, she's got herself over anxiety through the same, the yeah. same way. And so now she can apply it to other parts in her life. And, and I think that's really, She's particularly awesome, Diane. Amazing. I, Diane. Think, I don't think she would mind. Yeah, I love her. Um, yeah, she's great. And I think that's true. So that she applied her lessons. And you know what? That apply, or this is beyond the scope of the agoraphobia discussion, but it, especially here in the U.S. where we're just prescription crazy, um, we like to medicate being human here in the U.S. Yeah. Or at least we have for the last 20 years or so, 20-something years. So like, oh, I got divorced. I was depressed. Here's, a, here's some antidepressants. My dad died. Here's some antidepressants. Lost my job. Here's some antidepressants. Like we sort of forgot that he, medicating humanity is, might not be a good idea. Yeah. And humans aren't programmed to, f they're not supposed, you're not supposed to just feel amazing all the time. It's no. okay to not feel amazing all no. the time. That's what I was trying to tell, remind myself of when, when I was like recovering. It's just like, I just assumed everyone else was fine all the time and they're not. Yeah. No, they're in not. Anyways, they're doing terribly a lot of the time. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know what? And I think the difference is, I think we, I don't know if you and I have talked about it or Billy and I have talked, I've talked about it uh, some with somebody or on my own. But I, like for me, I remember sitting in the car a very specific morning, one of those mornings when I, I just rolled out of bed and got in the car. And I drove around for a while, very close to my house, but it was just more about time than distance for me in the beginning. And I remember sitting in the parking lot of a little shop that's right near my house and people were pulling up next to me and they were getting out of the shop and going in and buying whatever they were buying. And I remember looking, there was a woman who had parked diagonally from me and I was just sitting in the car and I remember looking at her and she's, she pulled up into her parking spot and she just sat there and she was rubbing her eyes and she just like, looked like the last place she wanted to be was in that parking lot going in to buy orange juice or whatever the hell she had to buy that day. And I remember the light bulb going off thinking like, she probably didn't sleep last night. Who knows what is going on in this woman's life yeah. right now? She does not look happy. She doesn't want to be here what's the difference between me and her? You know, I may actually have a better life than her right now. It's possible, you know, and it really made me think about that. And I, that's when I started using other people, complete strangers as models to a certain extent, yeah. you know, and, and I would go out and do my exposures. I would literally look at complete strangers and say like, well, that guy, let me imagine that he didn't sleep at all last night. Maybe he just lost his job. Maybe he just, his dog just died or something terrible just happened. I didn't want that to be, but, and he's still just walking through the supermarket buying milk or he's standing waiting in line at the bank, or he's going off to work today like everyone else does. And yeah. it was hugely liberating to do that too. So there's so many lessons that you can learn when you go th down this path and, 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 you know, win this war, win the war, whatever you want to call it. But, yeah. you know, the other thing that I'd probably say, and we can start to close on a little bit, I don't know how you think about this, but I hear all the time, I use those, hear those motivational words like warrior and, you know, or we're warriors, W-A-R-R, -R, not warriors, warriors, you know, like. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> we're warriors. We're wa well, we are warriors, but I guess, we're, we're war you know, warriors, and this will beat everyone to their knees. They don't understand how we're so strong with this, with that. You know, like, those are all good things. I, don't get me wrong. I'm all for that. You know, I'm as caveman as the next guy. But to a certain extent, I think it's so much deeper than that. You know, the, the ability to learn to be soft and analytical yeah. And, and take things in and then reflect them back out or direct them more so than, you know, that concept of like, I'm just going to draw my sword and hack and slash and burn through this agoraphobia. Yeah. There's some of that, but it's, it's a lot deeper than that. So it's, yeah. it's worth taking the trip, man. Just, just start today. Like start today. 
If it's like your I really like your analogy of the the tree like you spend don't you bend but break. you don't break I, it's so important are, that it wound up right here <laughs> it's okay. actually on my shoulder this tree is bending in the wind it's so important to me that it's the central part of this piece like it's on me forever now yes so and that tree it bends but it does not break because if you're so strong against something and it, it comes up against you and you're like not get like it can break you whereas if you just bend yeah. and yeah, you just bend and go with it, you know, and and it's just it's a, it's a better way to live, because I think that bending thing also uses less energy, you know, in a way. Mm -hmm. Like, all right, I can I can dodge, you know, like the Matrix, you know, when he was dodging the bullets. Like, it's a whole lot better than trying to block them and absorb the energy. Just let them go past you. So, yeah, yeah it's, it's. I think that fight it is really like, but it has to be like very concentrated into a very tiny bit, which is going out the door, or do you know what I mean? Just like yes. the. No, I'm yeah. gonna go, and it comes down to like literally a millisecond of it, like a decision in your brain of just like, no, I'm gonna do this. Oh, fuck it, I'm going. Yeah, <laughs> you know? yeah, I think you're right. So, and, so like, that. that's that's that fight, and you have to compress it down to this like tiny just moment. And as soon as you've made that decision, you just go with it. You know. That's a really that's really solid. That's actually very very true. So the warrior, the strength, the uh, the, the slashing and burning with the sword and the torch is about tiny concentrated moments of intense strength where you yeah. lean forward and push back because there is pushback. It's not all about being soft, not all the time, but the, the time when you gather up that strength from inside you, when you push on that thing and you, and you push back on it or you're right. That's the moment that you walk out the door. That's the moment you turn the key. Yeah, no, I'm going back in the supermarket. Right. And, and that's that thing when sometimes it's part of my friends, you just fuck it, you know? And, I, and I, yeah. literally I'm writing a chapter entitled that one of this book that I'm working on now. Like everybody that goes down this journey has had, the, if you have not had the effort moment, you're not on the journey yet. And that yeah. moment has to come like, and you will push back at that. And that's it. And, but then once you've made that push and you broke through that barrier, then you're going to go soft again. And just let it come until it's time to push again for a second. But this, I don't know if you've ever experienced like, um, like we used to climb up this sort of waterfall thing and then like jump in and it would be really like scary if you like stood on the, and if you stood on the edge for too long, like man, no one jumped. Yeah, I'm not doing it. Yeah. You just <laughs> think about it too much. And so like you're standing there and, and you're kind of thinking that, but what if I hit this rock and what, and you know that you can make the jump really, do you know what yeah. I mean? But, and at some point you will not jump unless you just go fuck it and you just stop right. thinking about it and you just go yeah and you're like, well whatever happens happens but fuck it just step off the the ledge yes you know? like and that's that sort of you, those leaps of faith that we have to do of like yeah i'm fuck it i'm going out the door i'm getting on that plane i'm going out and it, even if it's like not the actual physical thing but it's just that making the decision and sticking with it stick to your plan you know yeah that takes a lot of courage in that tiny moment, but it's also just like a and okay, fuck it, and just yeah. stop thinking about it and just yeah. you know make and, that decision and going with. It. And that's that first time you step out the door after being housebound, or the first time that you truly accept when that 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 worst panic you can think of, that fear comes just rises up through you and it's boiling over, and you just like all you want to do is run, and you're convinced that this is the end. That is a fuck it moment too. Like okay. Mm -hmm. Bring it right. I would rather you fucking kill me here than go backwards. Like at some point you get to that. And, and that's, you know, you, if, if you're going to kill me, you better kill me right now. Like this yeah. is it. That, and so we all have those moments and we have them in little micro bursts while we're doing our exposures. And we have them in very large epiphanous moments when we are starting yeah. ready to I take. I think I had to do that when I was young, you know, going back to school and all that sort of stuff. In the end, I just had to say, do you know what? Fuck it. If people see me having a panic attack, I don't actually care right. anymore. I don't care. I anymore. just learned to not care, which yeah. um, probably is why I then became like a performing musician because I just don't, like, do you know what I mean? You have to put, you're putting yourself out there yeah. all the time. So this sure. this criticism that you think you're having when anxious and you're like, no one's actually criticizing you to then every time you step on stage, you know, you're putting yourself up to people going, boo, that's rubbish. That's the worst song I've ever heard. Right. <laughs> Potentially, you know? And so like, you just drive yourself crazy if you focused on all the negative responses that you could get. So at some point you've just got to go like, I don't really care what they think. I'm just going to get up on the stage and do my thing. You know, yeah. I'm just going to go into my school classroom and 
do my thing. And if that means having a panic attack in front of people, that means having a panic attack in front of people. It is Who, what it by is. the way, don't care anyway. No, <laughs> could not care less. Not in the least bit interested. It's so funny yeah. that there are, and we're going really long here. We'll wrap it up. But I, there are videos that I found on YouTube. There's one, a couple of famous ones. There's a, there's a bunch of them out there. Of, of celebrities who obviously have a panic attack in public. There's an American, I didn't even know the guy's name, he was an American newscaster. He was, you know, one of our major news networks. Oh, I've seen that, yeah. Have you ever like, seen oh, that one? this guy have a live panic right, attack? Right, exactly. Yeah. And, 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 you know, and you could see it in his face. They go back to him and he just, he just that's it. He can't talk. He's, and you know exactly what is, what's happening. And I often wonder when I've seen those videos, like, does the rest of the world, like the normal world, do they care so much? Like those 2 million views, my gut tells me that 80% of those 2 million views are people with panic disorder. Like yeah, yeah, everybody else yeah. doesn't really care that the guy had a panic. They can't relate to it. It's like, they don't think anything of it. It just is what it is. It doesn't actually so, look that interesting anyway, does it? No. It's just someone sort of freezing a little bit. No, he just, <laughs> right. He sort of freezes and uh, you could tell he's a little bit, you know, agitated, but. You know like, that in like, his head, it's oh. like, yeah. and like you know freaking out completely Absolutely. but actually yeah. on the outside it's just kind of like oh is he having a panic attack does well those of us who've experienced it can look at the guy and understand what's going on but i think the rest of the world would just look and say well, boy it looked like he just got like stage fright or something you know it's, yeah it's not no major deal so yeah there's so many things to get over but it's worth it so i think the way we should probably you know i know i've said it about a million times in the last five minutes or so but like if you're watching this or listening to this and you have not left your house in a while and you are just upset with yourself and you think it, it, you don't want to be like that anymore Then, what I, you know, what I say, like start right now. I don't know what time it yeah. is and what day it is where you are watching or listening. Don't plan it no for tomorrow. Reason. No, there's no Because reason. then the anticipation builds as well. Just go, okay, I forgot. I'm going to go now. I'm going to just right. put my car. <laughs> and I know that happens. I've heard that too. Like, oh, I watched your video and it, it inspired me to do this or that. But, and so I'll temper that by saying, if you've been housebound for the past month, you know, don't get in your car and drive 60 miles from home. No. because you're psyched up. That will backfire on you. But at a minimum, like do something that makes you uncomfortable right now. Start right now, right this very minute. And you know, it, it's worth it. It's well worth it. So that yeah. was um, the last note I made was just with the exposures, um, just to do them little but often. You know, like yes, um, yeah. Just it doesn't have to be just once a day. No. twenty times a day it doesn't. As often as you possibly can. Just as often as you possibly can. Yeah, and like but little, but yeah, definitely not too big. Like because so I went from, you know, like eight months at at home, unable to even step outside my door. I couldn't even go to the garden gate. You know, my dad was like, just come and stand at the garden gate. And I just yeah. couldn't. couldn't. Do it. I mean, yeah. I could, but I couldn't, you know. Right, wouldn't. And um, so then the idea of me going like, oh yeah, I'll just go back to school then, you know, would have yeah. been insane. So it was like gradually, gradually, gradually. And in the end, I just, I started going to just registration, which was like 20 minutes in the morning. I didn't even do a full lesson. And then I'd come home. And then, you know, a couple of weeks of that. And then I would do one lesson and then come home. And, and then yeah. within about four weeks, I was fully back at school, which was... And, and my guess would be that once you got to the point where you could say do three lessons, getting to seven was not that big a jump. The jump from the 20 minute registration to the first two lessons was huge. But the lesson, but yeah. staying two periods to seven periods, not as huge. So yeah, yeah and it, it, that's a thing. So yes, yeah, start small. Just as long as you feel uncomfortable, then you're doing it right. So yeah. just whatever makes you feel uncomfortable is where you start and just do it as often as possible. Tiny little steps forward every single time. And next thing you know, like, holy cow, you're at the garden gate. Next thing you know. Right. So yeah. Yeah, it happens. And you'll feel good. And all of a sudden your life won't feel like crap anymore. Like you're moving forward. Again. And that just take that fight and just compress it into the tiny moment of making the decision and then soften and relax and yep. just yep. let it happen. And, and you'll learn Stick to your plan. Let it happen. Yeah. yeah. And I, I think you'll learn too, like when it's time to fight and when it's not time to fight, like mm. get, you get good at knowing like, Oh, this is one of those moments where I got to be strong, you know, and then you do it and then go soft again. So yeah, it, but it's like anything else. You have to learn to do it. You have to learn that also. So don't, don't, there's a lot of things. There's a lot of stuff that goes into it. Just don't, don't start right now. Take a lot of tiny steps all the time and just don't judge, judge yourself harshly for feeling anything you feel. It's all correct. So yeah. 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 So that's the deal. All right. So we will uh, try not to wait weeks and weeks <laughs> between these. We'll try and schedule chapter nine for next week if possible. And 
Yes, and here's a nice, t the positive thing is chapter nine is being yourself again. We're oh. over all the, the Yeah, the, she, she starts talking about the better stuff, right? So Yeah, being yourself again. Yeah, yeah. So very good. All right. So I guess that's it. Thanks for stopping by for chapter eight, this marathon session. We've been going for quite a while now. And uh, this is like the shortest chapter as well. Sorry. I know. I just, well, we got off on a bunch of tangents, but I think it was all good. So that's fine. <laughs> and um, yeah, we'll see you guys next time. If you're, so how to get to us, I always have to end that way, right? My, my website, thatanxietyguy.com, Facebook, Twitter, all this, that anxiety guy all the time. Join the discussion group. Holly's involved too. So it's that's really good. good. I really like it. Uh, ask questions, and it's been the best. I think that's the best place if you can. You can comment on the video, and I and I will answer. Uh, you know, Holly will chime in, I guess, when she can. But um, really, the Facebook discussion group has been the best place to actually bring up questions, because then other people see your questions. And there's some other really, answer. really good people in there, there as are. well. That have yeah, yeah, there are there's some solid and... people who are further down the road who yeah. are lending their experience, and, and it's really great. I'm very appreciative of that. So, all right, folks, see you next time. Ta-ta.